This is Inspiring Careers with your host, Ingrid Centurion. We're gonna talk about fascinating technologies that will impact your future. Meet inspiring entrepreneurs and people that are making huge differences in the community and around the world. We're gonna share career and life lessons of inspiration and success. Our mission is to inspire our viewers to make a better life for themselves by sharing our stories, our interviews, and documentaries. Please stay tuned as we have incredible guests coming up. Welcome to Inspiring Careers. Today I have a very special guest, Alana Yaren Fishbeam. She's a doctor of social work and she graduated from the University of Pennsylvania and received a master's degree from Rutgers University and also a bachelor's degree from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem in social work. She specializes in child welfare. Her early training was in clinical social work and she's advanced in her career and she's focused on planning, policy, management and research. Dr. Fishbeam grew up in Israel and served in the Israeli Defense Force. She's married a full-time mother of three boys, 19, 10, and eight, and she lives in Gladwin, Pennsylvania, a suburb of Philadelphia. She is the founder and president of a grassroots movement called No Left Turn in Education. Thank you so much for being on Inspiring Careers today. And I'm so honored to have you on the show. I want everyone to learn all about your story and, and share with us. What's really interesting to me is your background and tell us a little bit more about your background and where you grew up. Uh, thank you for having me on your show. I'm delighted to be a guest. Uh, I grew up in Israel. I was born in Israel. However, my parents didn't, were not born in Israel. They came to Israel in 1950 after Israel was established and the Jews from all Muslim countries had to literally flee for their lives. Uh, they grew up in Iraq, uh, but uh, they were one of those Jews that never left Babylon, old Babylon, and stayed there and then it became Iraq. But at that point, after thousands of years in Iraq, they had to flee for their life because of the animosity between Israel and the neighboring country, unfortunately. Uh, they came to Israel that had nothing. Uh, a lot of Holocaust survivors who made it to Israel, a lot of uh, refugees, almost a million refugees from all those Muslim countries coming to Israel. No housing, uh, very little food. So they lived for years in tent camps. Winter, summer, and I remember stories of my parents, how difficult it was during those years. At the same time, there was a Russian system with the food. They were getting basically food stamps for very little food, depending on the size of the family. Uh, but again, we know, my family knew, like all the other Jews who gathered in Israel, that this is our hope to build the homeland and work together in order to secure a future for the next generation of Jews that can find a home in Israel if they are persecuted uh, and threatened anywhere in the world. So I grew up in a uh, really poverty. We had literally nothing. Uh, we, My mother was pregnant with my fifth brother and we lived in 300 square feet and we moved to a luxury apartment 560 square feet when we were five kids and my parents. Uh, but again, this was uh, our country. We were free. We were poor, but we were free. And we were defending our country. And such an amazing story. And tell us, how did you, what made you want to go into social work? I, I want people who are listening and our viewers to understand, you know, what is it that drives, what's that passion that made you focus on social work? Growing up in what is actually was a slum in Israel, in public housing, seeing the despair of people, but knowing that people really strive to better their life and often need very little help just to put them on the right track, just to give them the right, uh, uh, you know, material maybe to help them move to the place that they could reach because they had the potential. It's just the circumstances that were in Israel at that time as well as uh, tension between the Jews that came from 
European countries versus the Jews that came from Muslim countries. Uh, in many ways, it uh, can resemble what has happened here in the United States in terms of racial tension. But here it was really between Jews that came from different backgrounds. Uh, so that's really what drove me to social work and particularly to child welfare, because I really felt that if we give the kids what they need early on in life, we really can put them on the right track of success. And uh, that's what led me to go from clinical work to understand the human being, the person, and then advance uh, into the more macro social work so we can look at the entire system and how to lift the kids and bring them to uh, maximize on their potential. Now, I got connected with you actually through Twitter. I saw a post that you were reaching out, no left turn in education, was reaching out to a student in Nevada can you share with us this story? So let's get into it right away. The amazing things that you're doing to help people out there, help parents who um, are, are getting blown off by, by their teachers, by their principals, by their superintendents, by their school board committees. Share with us that story. Uh, we, after my own experience uh, in the public school where my two younger kids were attending uh, and the imposing of the critical race theory curriculum and lesson plans and ho horrific books that they were uh, teaching them i decided to pull my kids out of that school and put them in a school private school that does not engage in this kind of indoctrination however uh, a lot of people who uh, criticized me when i wrote to the superintendent and questioning the validity and the purpose of this kind of uh, teaching um, People criticize me, but at the same time, there are a lot of people who write me private messages of support. And as a result, I felt that since they are really have all those people who are supporting what I'm doing, however, afraid to talk and stand up and push back and exercise their own right, A, of free speech and B, of citizen taxpayers who are paying actually for this kind of teaching and curriculum and indoctrination. Uh, so I decided to launch the movement in the end of August, and uh, the movement. Now, when, when, when did you when did you write your personal letter to the school superintendent? The school implemented the curriculum two days before the end of the school year, last school year, academic year. So I wrote about a few days later, and I wrote it to the superintendent, the school board, as well as the principal. And what uh, did you say in that letter? In that letter, I uh, told them that how surprised I was to uh, receive this kind of curriculum. I did not understand why they decided to literally flip Martha Luther King teaching upside down and uh, reject it and uh, embrace the BLM teaching, basically. Uh, it was not clear. It was not clear to me what was the purpose. What are they trying to achieve? Particularly looking at the content of the lesson plan and the book, it was very obvious that they are undermining, first of all, the relationship between kids, the natural human relationship between kids. Kids, but at the same time, also they are undermining uh, their ability to achieve to the maximum of their potential, uh, because. No. When, when you wrote the letter to the superintendent, did he get back to you? Did he respond? What was his reaction? Uh, ignore, ignored it altogether. Uh, all those entities that I wrote to ignored it altogether, never responded. And that was actually the reason that led me to write, to post the letter on the parents' Facebook page, the school, at the school. And that's where I was, uh, as I was telling them, I was lynched. Uh, they were attacked publicly. Uh, viciously and calling me a lot of names, uh, you know, races and bigots and not in our school. Uh, but again, those were the public messages. Uh, and they were actually a handful. But more messages I got from parents and other grandparents and concerned citizens that felt that I was right and they were supporting me. But at the same time, all of them were concerned and afraid to speak up. And uh, so that's really uh, the concerning thing for me, what's happening now in our country, that so many people are afraid to stand for their human rights, for the basic rights. They're not government-given rights. They're human rights. They're God-given rights. We should be allowed to speak. 
we should be allowed to uh, express our opinion we should be allowed to do things that now we are forbidden from doing they are shutting us down in every way possible including social media so this is really the reason i got up and uh became a voice for those parents and they are flocking to the movement from all over the country from coast to coast and hawaii uh, people are really um, almost like um, looking for a rope uh, for you know to to cling to to for to save themselves. Uh, they are desperate. They are horrified. They are in despair and anxious, not knowing what to do. Uh, and I feel that I almost like fell into this naturally because again, with my background in social work and my uh, tendency to to go and help, and particularly when it relates to children. And looking at their future what kind of future are they going to have if this is what our country is turning into we are turning with this philosophy into a racist country so dr fishbean i'm so glad that you are taking this issue on because with your background you are the expert you understand as a mom as a professional as children being your specialty let's talk about mrs clark in nevada and how she reached out to you and how you're able to help her and her son the, the what's going on with her son right now in the high school in nevada can you share that story with us um two weeks after i launched my movement in uh, on september 16 i was invited to appear on tucker carlson uh, this really, I can say, this is when our movement really got launched. Until then, I had like 300 visitors to our Facebook. And within a week, we had over a million people writing from all over the country and sharing stories, sharing materials, sharing their concerns, sharing their agony. And one of them was Miss Clark. And she contacted us indeed from Las Vegas, Nevada, and telling me the story of what her son has been experiencing at school as a senior. He's been in that school for, in that school for six years, uh, and with the CRT curriculum, uh, they were imposing on him to exercise their worldview. Uh, and in that sense, they were, uh, you know, uh, providing a lesson where kids had to literally claim an identity, something that is very private, claim an identity with regard to their sexuality with regard to their uh, color skin, with regard to their religious beliefs, uh, with every perspective that is basically more the uh, outer characteristic of the human being, rather than the uh, personal, uh, our fingerprint in terms of our personality, in terms of our thoughts, our likes, our beliefs, that was not important. What was important is all the things that I mentioned before, which is really uh, the staple uh, for what CRT is all about. Uh, the son did not want to participate, and she felt, particularly also growing with Judeo Christian values, uh, this was not in alignment with her life and her values and her principles, and they objected. They, in fact, just requested to pull out of the class to, uh, you know, uh, the same I did with my kids. Uh, but uh, in, in my school, usually they allowed me to keep my kids out of the classes that I thought were inappropriate. But in her case, they would not let her up, her son out of the class. And they were constantly doubling down and they had a lot of back and forth conversation, including in writing. Uh, and they were threatening her, in fact, and her son, A, for failing him in the class and B, not graduating him from school. And he's a senior, a very good student. Uh, she has been looking for help uh, after she tried uh, to all those uh, levels in the school education. And nobody. And, and, and let me, let, let's pause there and explain that. A lot of this is happening all across the country, not only in America, it's happening in other countries. And the parent reaches out to the leaders in the school and they basically just get ignored. Correct? Ignore or they double down. Uh, literally, okay. literally uh, often what we are getting uh, from parents that they're not even bothering to respond. And when they try to appear on school board uh, committee 
Uh, even when in a Zoom call, they limit the time. Uh, even some parents told us they used to allow a three minute per person. Now they're cutting down to one minute. What can you say in one minute to express in an intelligent way your argument? So uh, people are really being very frustrated, not being receiving any response or being cut off and brushed away uh, and uh, totally being pulled out of the decision about the education of their children. And when it comes to your children, when it comes to our youth, this is where parents need to stand up for their rights and protect their children's moms and dads out there who are listening. These are success stories and it takes people like you and I and others to stand up for their children and be heard. We cannot allow these school superintendents and the school boards to just ignore what the, the people, uh, the constituents are saying. In fact, uh, what happening today, I can say very clearly, the schools have been hijacked uh, by the teachers unions and many of the teachers, not all of them. There are a lot of teachers that are writing us and educators and school counselors and are very much not happy to say the least about what's happening. They are objecting to it, but they are in a very difficult spot in that regard. But still, the school had been hijacked using our taxpayers' money to turn our kids against us. And this is not only a problem for parents, it's a problem for grandparents, any concerned citizen that think about the future of this country. They are focusing now on K to 12. And as Lenin said, give me your kids for eight years, I'll turn them into good Bolsheviks. We do not want Bolsheviks. We want free citizens, critical thinker uh, population, not population that will march to the orders of any dictators. So in this regard, uh, not only that they are ignoring us and hijack the school and our kids are basically captive audience, they are fighting any chance for transparency. Uh, parents are fighting time and time again to get the information about what, are the, what is the curriculum, what is the material that's being taught, who are the entities, the organization that are coming to our schools uh, training the teachers and then coming to our children and how much money because in fact what's happening today uh it's very interesting our standing in terms of rank internationally in math in science and literacy is going down we are really nearing the bottom whereas our teaching time in terms of how much time we provide for all this curriculum, for CRT, for comprehensive sexuality education, for all those lessons that provide the kids literally nothing but hate uh, is, uh, is incredible. The amount of time and the amount of resources that is expended. Our goal is very basic to start up. The really the top goal is bring parents back to the role in the education of their children. The Department of Education was instituted in 1979. At that time, when they wrote the law, when they instituted the department, they specifically noted that the parents have the primary responsibility for educating their children. And the state and the localities have the supporting role. That's the responsibility to be supporting of the parents. And in fact, today it's totally opposite and we are totally pushed out of our, the education of our children. You know, you say on your website that you really are building a generation of critical thinkers. And this is so important. How do you plan in um, No Left Turn Education to really focus on the critical thinking skills? Uh, First of all, uh, it looks like still many parents are not aware of what's happening. Uh, parents have different life circumstances. Uh, they are busy, and particularly with the, what's happening in the past uh, year and so, uh, with the coronavirus as well, the, the, the health issues, uh, many parents still are not aware. So one of the goals that we have, and it's going to be on our website, is it's now going through a major upgrade. So in two, three weeks, we have a, a brand new website with a lot of information. Educate the parents. Educate the parents about, first of all, what's going on in school. 
What are they trying to shove into the brains of our kids? What is the poison that they're poisoning their brains and their hearts? First of all, we have to educate the parents and everybody else. Second, on the other hand, will provide also a lot of resources in terms of what is really, quote unquote, the truth, the facts. So parents will know that there, there is an alternative. There is a uh, material that is better in terms of educating the kids and bring them to maximize on their potential and not create animosity and head and segregation. What the current teaching is leading is really definitely to a segregation. They're promoting segregation. They're promoting actually underachievement because they are dumbing down the system instead of lifting the kids and providing the kids that have difficulties with opportunities to really maximize on what they can achieve, they're actually dumbing the system. So this is one thing. The second thing will provide also tools for parents to know how to act and what to do in order to claim their role as the primary with the primary responsibility that they have for the education of the kids. We cannot let this situation go on because we're going to lose our kids we're going to affect, it's going to affect our, our communities. It's going to affect our nation. We cannot lose this generation. Once it's, we're going to be retracting this way, it's really a very dangerous road. Now you love to collaborate and so do I. I love to collaborate. I love to communicate. I love to educate. And you're collaborating with other organizations. Can you share with us some of them and other uh, partners that you're looking for? as my show airs all throughout New England and Massachusetts and many other states. I definitely want people reaching out to you to collaborate and, and help our children. Uh, this is very important goal. We are not, when I say we, I'm saying people like us who are fighting this are not flooded with billions of dollars like BLM and the teachers union and all those groups that are unfortunately uh, sitting on very important intersection of power in politics, in media and technology. Unfortunately, we don't. But what we do have is we the people. We are the majority. We are the silent majority that is silent no more. We are waking up. And the critical thing, because we do not have the material resources, but we do have the people, it's really incumbent upon us to find like-minded people and uh, get together, share information, uh, share resources, and collaborate. Uh, one of these organizations, for example, who has been doing an amazing work for 20 years in uh, on the in the area of uh, uh, comprehensive sexuality education is Protect Child Health Coalition. There are people from all over the country that are part of this coalition. You mentioned in our conversation previously about uh, mass resistance, also doing a wonderful job around the country in many communities with regard to comprehensive sexuality education. Now there are a lot of other parents group uh, all over the country that are starting to wake up, like in California, there is a, a group uh, called FAIR in Santa Barbara. Uh, they are fighting their school board about the curriculum with CRT. Uh, there is also, um, uh, there are groups in different places in California, in New York, a new organization just started called FAIR. They are also fighting. But also what I've been uh, getting is parents group that are starting to get together, approaching me, I said, look, uh, we have here 40 uh, parents. We have here uh, 400 parents. We have already, you know, they're starting to organize and looking to somewhere to come together because our power is by being together. Our power is by collaborating because each one of us in individual school board will not do the job. It's like I say when people tell me, you pull your kid out of school, you solve your personal problem. So why do you need all this? because it's still my personal problem. We live in this country, we live in this community, and if everybody around us is gonna be indoctrinated, what, we're gonna live in a ghetto? Like we Jews well, live in ghettos over centuries? I'm so glad that you're able to motivate and inspire other parents to be concerned for their children's education, because all the organizations that you mentioned, it all comes down to the curriculum in the school. They're concerned over subjects and topics that are being, you know, that their children are being exposed to at a very young age. And these parents are saying, no, 
That is not your responsibility, schools, school system. What you need to focus on is math, science, English, reading, comprehension, the basic skills. I always say it's the basic skills. Let's get back to doing the basics, then, then coming up with these, these new topics that they're adding to the curriculum. And the other thing that's so important is, you know, I grew up poor like you. My dad died when I was two years old, and my mom was a single mom. And my mom wasn't very educated. She didn't know what was going on to the school. And, and if I was alive today and the story was flipped, my mother wouldn't know what is going on in school. And we need people like you to be the leaders, to educate the parents, because the children are suffering. And I'm, I thank you so much for doing what you're doing and, and sharing your story today. Um, how can everyone reach you? Um, tell us how our viewers can reach you, donate to you, support you, ask you questions, because you also have chapters around the country. Uh, as I mentioned before, we are really working hard now to upgrade substantially our website and all the information I mentioned during you know, we don't have a chapter in your state and you would like to start one, please don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you today for being on the show and giving us an update on what you're doing. Uh, we are uh, almost at the end of our time. We look forward to hearing from you again, hearing other success stories that you're having all across the country in protecting our children. Thank you so much. I'm Ingrid Centurion and this is Centurion's Arena. Just like the ancient Romans who battled in the sandpit using swords, spears, and all types of weapons to entertain the people. In my arena, we're gonna battle it out with facts, perspectives, and real world stories. Let the people decide. Get ready for an amazing and entertaining show. Today we have two amazing people who are gonna share their perspectives on why America is so important. And so many Americans may take the freedoms we enjoy for granted. We have Sophie Underwood and Anton Teodescoro. I was either lucky or unlucky enough to grow up in Romania, in a communist country under Ceausescu, who was a, uh, for many people who today may not have heard of him, he was kind of next to Stalin and uh, Mao Zedong, kind of their third one in the, uh, in the triad. And, um, I was lucky enough to get to this country because I had a brother who actually did the hard work for me. And he ended up crawling across the border from Yugoslavia into Italy, literally across barbed wire and guns and uh, you know, people and all the system set up to keep you inside the country, not to let you, you know, to, to keep you outside.